For five years, World in Action has investigated Britain's Nazi gangsters. They're vicious. They've even planned murder. People came very close to getting killed by Combat 18 activists. Tonight, the explosive secret at the heart of Britain's Nazis. Now, the war is coming. Their deeds are wicked, their image is ugly, and they are driven by ancient hatreds. For most of the 1990s, a fanatical band of thugs have tried to bring Hitler's ideas to the streets of Britain. They have committed crimes of intimidation, violence, arson, and murder. But they had their uses too the security services infiltrated them to find out about even more murderous fanatics in Northern Ireland. Tonight on World in Action, we have evidence that the leader of a gang of Nazi terrorists was a special branch informer. And we show how his work as an informer broke all the rules and left some of the targets of his racist gang unprotected. <laughs> Meet Charlie Sargent. He likes to threaten people. He likes to attack people. For five years, he led a gang of thugs who wanted to bring Nazi ideas back to life. Charlie Sargent's known as the pig. He's a bit of an animal. He loves violence. He's a, he's a knife merchant. He loves knives. He'd stab anyone. He'd stab me or anybody he worked with. If you cross Charlie Sargent or grasped, then Charlie Sargent would have you seen to. Uh, and if he was close enough, he'd do it himself. He gives out orders, recruits people. He's the man. He had the support of quite a few heavyweights in the, in the movement. And he used to, like, the fact that he knocked about with them gave him some, well, quite a lot of street cred. And people respected that, if not him. The group he led was called Combat 18. Even its name was a homage to evil, the first and eighth letters of the alphabet, the initials of Adolf Hitler. And it was set up for one purpose. Combat 18 had no political agenda. Combat 18 was just to deal with things on a violent level, to pay back time for us. And with a vengeance, Combat 18 set about its business. We have got your location and where you live and we'll be watching you, and we're going to take you out. Just let her know the Combat 18 have got her eye on her. We're going, to, uh, we're going to take her out. Death threats, hit lists, gang attacks. Combat 18 declared war on its opponents and other races. And then Combat 18 sent out arson squads. It set fire to the mat inside the doorway and started to ignite the wall there. Very fortunately, uh, we had friends of the paper sleeping in the building at the time uh, because we had just suffered a series of robberies. Uh, they found it almost immediately, extinguished it, and telephoned the fire brigade and the police. One Combat 18 activist who was involved in these terror attacks has agreed to speak to us if we concealed his identity. Charlie would put up the targets. He'd just come along and say, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? He'd say they were easy targets, and we'd get lots of publicity for C-18. But Charlie was never there. He'd stay well out of it. He'd say he was too high profile as leader to get involved. He just left it to us. People came very close to getting killed by Combat 18 activists at the behest of Charlie Sargent. Combat 18 was a reminder of some of the darkest urges in human nature. Their violence and extreme racism always made them a target for criminal investigation. But the police had another interest in them as well, because Combat 18 had friends in even darker places. In Northern Ireland, some of the most bestial attacks on innocent people have been at the hands of the Ulster Defence Association. For the UDA's gunmen, it's enough to mark you for attack that you went to the wrong school or worship in the wrong church. For the security services, 
penetrating the UDA was a major priority, but there were difficulties. The UDA went through a leadership change in 1990, which meant that immediately there was a whole new set of people that the RUC would not have been aware of. They, they also broke down into a cell structure, which I think from their point of view, extremely wise thing to do. And I think it did make it very difficult for the RUC to, uh, to have proper uh, or the same level of, of intelligence that they previously would have had. The new UDA leadership went on a sectarian killing spree. The security services were desperate for intelligence. One route into the UDA was through the Nazi hardmen of Combat 18. It had long been known that there were connections between the two organisations. Then, in 1993, police arrested three men transporting guns to Belfast. They were all UDA. But one of them, who'd driven the guns from London to Birmingham, was also a founder member of Combat 18. His name was Eddie Wicker. You sell UDA magazines? Yeah, no, no, I sell LPA magazines. The Loyalist Prisoners Association, That's right, yeah. which was set up by the UDA. Well, I don't know it was set up by... Yes, you do, Mr Wicker, it was set up by the UDA, and you know it because you're a member of the UDA. Well, what's it, what, what, is there a law against that or something? In fact, in Northern Ireland, there is. The UDA is banned because of its role in sectarian murders. Eddie Wicker was released when he convinced the Crown Prosecution Service that he didn't know what was in the bag. The other UDA men went to prison. But this hadn't been a one-off operation. Those guns the police found in Birmingham were from C18 members, but some of them had got through already. Probably a couple of dozen had already gone. And at the time Eddie got nicked, there was talk of a big consignment. Worth thousands. Not surprisingly, the special branch began to take a keener and keener interest in these links. A police officer who was involved in undercover work against Combat 18 has spoken to us anonymously. At that time, the special branch were really interested in the Irish connection, or any connections to Ireland through Scotland. That would be 1994 there was a very, very intense interest in Ireland. They kept coming back. Anything else? Have you heard anything else? But the same undercover officer was beginning to wonder about the leader of the group he was infiltrating. There was obviously someone in the inner sanctum who was working for the police, deep, deep undercover. I would go to meetings where things were discussed, and as far as I knew, I was the only police officer there. Then I'd get a call. Can you confirm this? This was before I'd even put my own report in. Someone was getting intelligence out before I could. I worked out it had to be someone in the top two or three. Then I concluded it could only be Sergeant himself. With the requests for confirmation that were coming down, it had to be him. Charlie Sergeant had secretly become a way for Special Branch to keep tabs on Loyalist gunmen in Northern Ireland. But all the while, his Combat 18 hit squads were up to no good on the mainland. And by now they were raising money for it. Combat 18's big earner was neo-Nazi rock music. They were making hundreds of thousands of pounds selling Nazi CDs all over Europe. The money was earmarked for very special purposes. been so quiet lately is that we've been doing a lot of reorganising, mainly in the form of active service units. It takes its name from the first and eighth letters of the alphabet. The initials of Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler. And for those of you that have any doubts where the money's gone, it's gone on these. Now the war is coming. Some of the hardline militants of uh, C18 wanted to take that approach, the hardline approach, and actually get out and do what people have been talking about for years. And what was that? Really get on some of the hardline stuff, real start hurting people, real make people take notice of us, move on to the next level. Sorry, what does that mean, move on to the next level? Up ourselves to a proper terrorist organisation. Combat 18 wanted to make a splash, so they organised a letter bomb campaign against people they regarded as enemies. Some were obscure political opponents, but others were famous people who had done them no harm at all, but who had committed the crime of falling in love with someone from another race. 
One of their first bombs was addressed to the former swimming champion, Sharon Davis. Just three months ago, Sharon Davis and her partner, Olympic sprinter Derek Redmond, produced this little chap here, Elliot. Thank you. She had upset them by marrying black athlete Derek Redmond and having a mixed race child. It was to show that no matter how public or high profile you were, you could still get whacked. The letter bombs were to show that C18 weren't a bunch of mugs. We'd had it with being a drinking club. It was like drawing a line in the dirt. We'd been talking about it all these years. Now we were doing it. The bombs intercepted in January last year were intended to be the first of many. Other targets who had been on Combat 18's potential list included Frank Bruno and footballer Paul Ince. The letter bombs were the idea of this man, Charlie Sargent's right-hand man, Will Browning. He's a man with a ferocious reputation. The bomb maker was a Danish Combat 18 member and a devoted admirer of Browning. His name was Thomas Nakaba. Thomas Nakaba was very well known here in Denmark since the late 80s, and he was uh, twice member of the Nazi party. Thomas was also one of the, the, the leading violent Nazis. He founded the Copenhagen division of Combat 18 because he wanted to fight in the streets. He had never tried it before. It was his first bomb. Browning told him how to do it, and maybe he has make, made some investigations himself, but mainly uh, he got the information from Will Browning. Thomas Nakaba built three bombs into video cassettes, but he didn't know that he was being watched. The Danish police had been tipped off by Scotland Yard. The first information we got concerning this case we received uh, from the British authorities and uh, based on that information uh, we started surveying a Danish citizen, Thomas. To cover his tracks, Thomas Nakaba caught the night ferry to Malmö in Sweden to post the letter bombs. And we also followed him to Sweden uh, where we uh, saw that he put uh, three videotapes uh, in a post box and uh, after uh, having a look at them, it was clear that uh, they did not contain videos, but they contained explosives and uh, detonators. The bombs were intercepted before they harmed anyone, but someone was damaged by this affair. It exposed Charlie Sargent as a police informer. Will Browning was already suspicious of Sargent, so when targets for the letter bombs were discussed, he laid a trap. Sargent was given the wrong names. Targets were selected by an inner council of Combat 18. That council involved Charlie Sargent. Several names were discussed. Names that Sargent was given were not necessarily ones that were to be recipients. Sargent was, was privy to a list that wasn't the list that was used at the final posting. It wasn't long before Browning's trap was sprung. When the letter bombs were discovered, the story broke in the British papers. They contained names of other people who were supposed to get letter bombs. But these names were from the false list which had been given to Charlie Sargent. At the same time, the post office circulated a warning from the police to sorting offices. It too contained names from the false list given to Charlie Sargent. That was what finally finished Sergeant as a Combat 18 member. That was what led to his expulsion. Sergeant's list that he was aware of included names that were leaked to the press. Those names, by that stage, had been removed from any list. So what conclusions did C18 draw from that incident about the Sergeant role of Sergeant? Sergeant must have been working with Special Branch. He must have been. Will Browning now took over the leadership of Combat 18 and expelled Charlie Sergeant. But Sergeant wasn't going to take it lying down. Charlie Sergeant wanted revenge. And some unfinished business gave him his chance. He still had things belonging to Combat 18, and Browning had things of his. 
a meeting was arranged and a friend of Browning's, Chris Castle, went to Sargent's house to make the exchange. Browning stayed out of sight. Waiting with Sergeant was an old friend and Nazi comrade, Martin Cross. Sergeant and Cross expected somebody to turn up on that morning acting on behalf of Will Browning. We knew from another witness who had actually been invited to be present that the plan was to attack whoever turned up to teach Will Browning a lesson. When Chris Castle arrived at Sergeant's house, he was set upon. As he tried to flee, he was stabbed in the back by Martin Cross, then chased and beaten by Sergeant. He was dead by the time he got to hospital. There is no doubt that Chris Castle was executed on that morning. Sergeant's arrest for murder finally confirmed what World in Action has also been told by a senior police officer, that Sergeant had friends in high places. When he was arrested, he immediately demanded to be seen by special branch officers, and they came. The presence of these Scotland Yard officers at the station didn't go unnoticed. Will Browning was also under arrest at that stage, and when he was interviewed, his solicitor made sure that special branch's involvement was recorded. Uh, I was told yesterday that there is intelligence um, about Mr Browning in relation to this allegation of conspiracy to commit uh, grievous bodily harm. It's also told by an officer that there is special branch involvement. I know nothing of this intelligence and I want to know why uh, there is possible special branch involvement in this matter. So, special branch officers were there and at Sergeant's request, but it did him no good. He was told that with a murder charge hanging over him, there was nothing they could do. Justice would have to take its course, and it did. Sergeant and Cross were convicted and sent to prison for life. Informants have always been vital to the work of the police and the security services, but it has long been recognised that they have to be treated with great caution. So the police have guidelines regulating what they can and cannot do, and these guidelines are very clear. The informant must not be the person who's putting forward the idea of indulging in some criminal activity. He must not be the planner. He should not be the person who's carrying out the action. Your informant, ideally, according to the code of practice, should be someone in a minor role, that is, a lesser role, who's not involved in planning or in the actual execution. Charlie Sargent drove a coach and horses through these guidelines. He committed crimes and he incited crimes, and they were serious crimes. Beatings and intimidation and firebombings were all carried out at his behest. The miracle is that only one person died. Running informants is always going to be a dangerous, issue, a dangerous issue. And I think it is quite hard to lay down clear guidelines that cover all cases. But there are some principles, and they are outlined in the Home Office guidelines, that really ought to be followed, and they would appear to have been breached in this case. But it might all have been much, much worse. Three years ago, Combat 18 was planning a new and serious terrorist campaign, and Charlie Sargent was at the heart of it. It was uncovered when police raided his deputy, Will Browning, in 1995. It was a very significant find that the police made. Combat 18 at that stage were looking for a high profile target to really put themselves on the map. The police found bomb making instructions. They found a sniper's manual. And they found that Combat 18 was targeting individuals for attack. Documents showed that at least 19 people had been targeted. Two were already being watched. One of them was a World in Action journalist, Quentin McDermott. Well, I was one of the journalists who, uh, with other members of the World in Action team, helped to expose Combat 18 originally as a violent terrorist organisation. And indeed, at the end of the first film we made, Charlie Sargent made a threat to shoot one of our journalists. So put, put it in your way, this is what's going to happen. And so we all came out of that film knowing that there was, if you like, a general threat that there might be uh, attempts at reprisals against us. So yeah, the team carried out a surveillance operation on that gentleman. That gentleman was in severe danger, and had it not been for those raids at that stage, I think that gentleman could well have been killed by Combat 18. We went there several times, watching his movements, 
we were going to do it. We were up for it. People were planning to wait outside and shoot him through the window or let him have one as he came out the door. Amongst the documents the police seized from Browning's house was a page from an electoral register. On it, the address of Quentin McDermott's basement flat had been highlighted and someone had written basement, number 52. World in Action had this document examined by a handwriting expert. The man who had pinpointed where Quentin McDermott lived was Charlie Sargent. Charlie Sargent selected the World in Action reporter for Combat 18. Charlie Sargent was the one that came with a copy of the electoral roll and the specific descriptions of where in the apartments this reporter lived. That's all Charlie had to do. He put that into people's minds and left them with it. And it was only the police raids that stopped this happening? Without doubt. That, was a, that attack on the World in Action reporter was at a very advanced stage just prior to the, the raids on Combat 18 activists in early 95. Will Browning was never charged with this murder plot. But even if there was not enough evidence to bring charges, surely the intended victims should have been warned by the police that they were in danger from Combat 18. But they weren't. I received absolutely no warning whatsoever on that occasion from Special Branch or from the police. I feel that although investigative journalists have a duty, if you like, to uh, take reasonable measures to protect themselves, uh, we are, after all, at the end of the day, members of the public, and we are entitled to the same level of protection as ordinary members of the public. And I believe that the police should have alerted me to the threat. Potential targets have the right, in my view, to be informed by the police. If the police are in possession of information, which means that those potential targets are at risk. If the police have that information, then it seems to me it's not only justice but fairness that the police should pass the information on to the targets so that they can take perhaps the most elementary precautions to avoid risk to themselves or their premises. And it wasn't as if the police could be sure that their raid on Browning had removed the threat of attack. Only two weeks later, Combat 18 firebombed the home of a political opponent in Kent. Charlie wanted her torched, you know, done. He was going on and on about her ages before the police raided us. It was all set in motion before the raids, and even after the raids had happened, it still went ahead, and he knew it was still going ahead. My son was out on the landing and he was shouting that the, the house is on fire, it, and, and as I came out the bedroom you could see it was all, all f uh, there was smoke everywhere, and um, you could see flames reflected. We had smoke alarms fitted and um, a lot of other precautions that we took made sure the inner door was shut because if on the, on the night of the fire bombing whoever it was that sprayed the petrol through, if we hadn't have had smoke alarms, if we hadn't had that door shut then it, it would have just come straight up the stairs and well we wouldn't have stood a chance, it's a really small terraced house and you know we, we would have all been dead. Well if there was a good reason for not informing Mr McDermott when the police initially became aware of the threat to him, perhaps because it would have tipped off the aggressors, uh, those reasons disappeared uh, with the fire bombing two weeks later uh, of, uh, of a woman in Kent. And it ought to have been clear to everyone from that point onwards that despite the police raid, uh, Combat 18 was still capable of mounting potentially lethal attacks. We've traced 10 of the people targeted by Combat 18 on the papers found in the raid on Browning. Not one of them was warned by the police. The question now is what Scotland Yard will do with our evidence. Clearly, Charlie Sargent did help them to foil the Danish letter bomb campaign. Against that, he ran a ruthless campaign of terror. He plotted murder. Finally, he did murder. But should he, could he have been arrested earlier? And how did Scotland Yard reward him? Our evidence suggests that when they forged an alliance with a man like Charlie Sargent, Scotland Yard were playing with fire.